we're going to talk about expectations in household finance today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a very brief um, overview of today's topic, just some observations based on where the research field is and what we're going to see. Then I'm going to talk about uh, one of my own research projects, personal experiences and expectations about aggregate outcomes. And while I do that, I'll give you some pointers about uh, common techniques and you know, kind of like approaches that we see in the literature. And then, of course, we have um, our other panelists presenting their own work. OK, so why do we care about expectations? Why do we have this as one of our topics? Well, this partially because beliefs or expectations are really key in understanding all intertemporal decisions, including household financial choices. So if you think about it, as soon as you have people making decisions about the future or where future outcomes or future states of the world play a role, then the expectations about these outcomes will matter for their decision making. And especially in household finance, many choices of financial instruments, many financial choices by definition include making a trade off over time. And so these are very important when it comes to household finance, maybe more in household finance than in some other areas of household um, decision making. Traditionally, people have been using the benchmark of rational expectations. But the idea, the idea here is that people use all publicly available information to come up with the expectations going forward. And that means that expectation errors should be unpredictable with current public information. There shouldn't be systematic biases or deviations. So basically, people make their best guess and on average, they're going to do OK. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of support in the data that um, would suggest that this is actually what people do. So Munsky in 2004 has a really nice overview where he outlines the deviations from this rational benchmark and why it just does not do a very good job in um, describing expectations as formed by households. So then that opens up our research field of how do people form expectations? Um, how are beliefs actually formed? Um, and then second, if we now better understand how people form beliefs, how do different beliefs affect behavior? Because ultimately, and you see this, this is something that this research field has particularly struggled with, is this kind of like, suggestion that, well, it doesn't really matter what people think as long as they don't act on it, or it doesn't really matter what they think about the future if their choices aren't too biased by that. And so we kind of want to argue that we care about expectations partially because they will affect choices, but that means we want to actually also study how they affect choices and to what extent beliefs translate into choices, whether some maybe do more or less or in what um, way they do so. And once we know a little bit more about how people form expectations and to what extent they affect behavior, then we can start thinking about the implications. So mostly you can think of this broadly as macro and with that I don't just mean macroeconomics, but for the broader context, how are asset market affected, how's the economy affected, how are the things maybe consumer regulation affected, what are the implications for these other fields based on what we learn about how people actually form expectations and how they affect their behavior. So how do we actually measure beliefs when we want to measure and analyze expectation? We basically have three broad choices. The first one, and that's been traditionally the preferred way in economics, is to infer expectations from prices and choices. The issue with that approach is that oftentimes once you kind of don't enforce um, strong assumptions on the form of these beliefs or the preferences that people have, you kind of can't really identify them. You will see that there are just many different types of beliefs in a combination with different preferences that will justify choices or prices. And so we can't always cleanly infer or identify them from these. So where does this leave us? The first other thing is that, well, this is people's beliefs. And so we can just ask people, you know, we can survey them and we can ask them, what do you think? There are a lot of surveys by now that ask people about beliefs. Um, I think the 
oldest kind of like most established one but still very relevant one is the Michigan survey that asked about a lot of belief choices and it really has a very long panel. So it's still very much used. Um, then there are newer surveys. Um, one I wanna mention is the New York Fed survey of consumer expectations that I'm gonna be using. That's also publicly available on the New York Fed's website. And that's been really a treasure trove for many research projects. But there are now a lot of household surveys that have um, at least a module on expectations. Almost every central bank um, all over Europe or in the world has a module on expectations. Many um, think tanks have some form of expectation survey, sometimes for firms or analysts or financial experts. So there is a lot of data on expectations out there that is not has not always been used to the maximum. And so I think that's actually a really exciting field for PhD students to dig into these data and see what can be done um, with this. In addition to um, these existing surveys, it is now also fairly possible for people to run and design their own surveys. With MTurk and other survey platforms, it's um, not that expensive. You don't need a big lab. Um, we see PhD students repeatedly be able to run um, these type of surveys. And so that is something that I want you to keep in mind where this might be an option for you as well in thinking about the, um, the research you wanna, um, you wanna do. Okay, then the last part is how do we kind of like learn about expectations and especially the um, way that in effect choices or outcomes is the use of expectation shifters. So I want to distinguish two, um, two types here. The first one is one where mostly we look at a variable that we know shifts expectations and we estimate the effect of this variable on any type of outcome we're interested in. And then we can argue that, that this effect must be coming through the shift in expectation. We don't necessarily observe the shift in expectations, but we observe the shifter. That's kind of a little bit an indirect way at getting at that, um, but it might it can be a very powerful way in settings where you don't have the right survey data of eliciting expectations directly. The second way that you can think of an expectation shifter is um, within a survey to get causal identification of expectations, you might wanna sometimes shift people's expectations. And so that is usually done through information provision where you provide people, you elicit their prior, you provide them with some information and there are ways that you can kind of use random variation in that information provision without misinforming participants. And then you ask them afterwards and you see how their choices have changed, how they have reacted to the shift in expectations. And so that allows you to causally ad, um, identify these shifts. There's a very new paper on this by uh, Heyland, Roth and Wolfhardt, um, Designing Information Provision Experiments. So if you're interested in any way in this direction, I very much um, recommend checking out their paper where they line out in detail how um, you would go about this. Okay, so using all of this, what have we um, what have we learned from expectations? Well, we have learned first of all that survey data is informative, and um, that rational expectations are often not consistent with the evidence. We kind of maybe suspected that, but I think that's been a very kind of a ground establishing work in this area to both show that the survey data is actually informative, that people don't really, they don't just tell us stupid things or don't take the survey seriously or just give random stuff. It's like, no, they're actually informative. And there's been a lot of work done in um, validating this by looking across surveys where the questions are asked slightly differently. And it seems surveys are informative. There's noise in there. And sometimes you have outliers, but in most part, there is information in these survey responses. Okay? And when we take this information seriously, we see that it just does not seem very consistent with the idea of rational expectations. 
So what else do we see? Kind of like, what do we see in the data? What patterns emerge in terms of what influences expectations? And here, I think the topic is broadly that expectations are strongly influenced by what is close to people. What does close mean? Well, things can be close in various dimensions. But for instance, things that are close in time, recent experiences, things that happened recently in the stock market, recent returns in the housing market, recent house price changes, they influence expectations much, much more than things that are less close, that are farther away in time, that experiences that people had a long time ago. The second finding generally is that something that is close personally influences um, expectations. So if you have personally lived through um, times of high inflation, if you have personally seen times of uh, macroeconomic recessions, that influences and that shapes people. So what they have personally seen just has a much stronger effect than what they hear about. Um, and so that will, to some extent, lead to differences across age cohorts, because of course, now some our parent generation remember something else than we do, and our children will remember the world differently because they haven't lived through the same time periods. Also, things can be close geographically. So this is what I will show you um, in a few minutes, that things that are closer geographically, local experiences, just are much more important in shaping people's expectations than you know, the average across the country. And finally, and this comes back to what some of you might have seen um, during our last session on peer effects, things can be close socially. So the experiences of friends, family, my social network, what they see, what they hear, what happens to them is closer to me socially. And I'm going to put more weight on this. I'm going to be more strongly influenced by the experiences or the information in my social network than I would be by other people who I'm less close socially. So overall, kind of things that are close in whatever way we want to define close tend to really have a very strong influence on expectations. Okay, now we know a little bit about um, what affects expectations, kind of like how are they formed. Now we want to ask our second question, how do different beliefs affect behavior? If I now have two people who hold different beliefs, say about the stock market or the housing market, or um, whether it is a good idea to save for retirement, do I see them actually following through on these beliefs and behaving differently? The big challenge here is really a data challenge. It is very hard to observe beliefs and actions in the same data set. We've seen some progress, but this is not common. It's kind of hard and it's something that the literature has struggled with. So what have people done? Well, the first one is coming back to the surveys where you have this wealth of information in the survey about what people believe, but you often don't have actual actions. So what people have done is ask people about what they did and what their intended actions are. And so we have much more information about survey elicited actions or intended actions that we can then link to surveys. That's maybe not perfect. We as economists really like to see the actual actions that people undertake, but it's a first step. And also I should mention that most more recently, more and more people have succeeded in actually linking survey um, expectations to actual administratively observed actions in the data and confirm that these intended actions or survey elicited actions are actually quite predictive of actual actions. The second approach comes back to the belief shifters or the inferred beliefs. Well, if I cannot observe beliefs and actions in the same data, I can take the beliefs data and ask people about the actions. So I focus on that part or I can do it the other way around. I can look at what do people do and I can see whether things that I think shift beliefs are also shifting behavior. And so if I find something that I can use as a proxy for inferred beliefs, then I might not know the actual beliefs, but I know what might have shifted them. And if I see that making a difference, then I can make an argument that this must be coming through beliefs. And I can again show that inferred beliefs affect actual actions. Takeaway, 
from either approach is that yes, beliefs affect actions. People tend to act on their beliefs and their actions tend to be broadly consistent in the direction with their beliefs. Finally, macro implications. So this is something that has is really, really a new literature. So I think this is like the last couple of years that we've seen people um, take this effect of beliefs, how people form beliefs seriously and ask what implications does that have? We've seen a few papers um, in asset pricing and of how, how do we do asset pricing? What do we learn about asset pricing if we take these belief formation processes seriously and also in macro models? Kind of what does this mean for the economy? This is a relatively new literature and I wanna say that's something you know, if you're more modeling inclined person, I think that's a really promising area where um, people have been very excited to see this incorporated into models and um, flesh out the implications. Okay, with that, we are ready to start um, with our research. I um, wanna mainly talk about my paper with Basit Safa on personal experiences and expectations about aggregate outcomes. This is squarely in this research part of how do individuals form expectations. Then um, after us, I wanna give you a brief recap for those of you who were there last time for um, the peer effects on the economic effects of social networks, evidence from the housing market, because that actually also goes through an effect of beliefs. And then afterwards, I'm gonna pass on to Johannes Yeran, Ricardo Kami and Michael, and they will tell you about various approaches to studying expectations. Um, what I really like that you see a lot of different methodologies. Um, so Yeran will be presenting you with an experimental paper, which is a very important um, type of research done in this area. And um, Ricardo will be, um, talking about an information provision experiment. So that comes back to what we um, saw earlier, that is one way to um, get causal estimates is to shift people's beliefs by information provision and then see how um, they update their uh, behavior. Tommy will be talking about how other things that are close to people and their own types, kind of like how they process information and um, what they experience affects their um, expectation. And in a similar way, um, Michael will be talking about how what people experience when they do grocery shopping, kind of what's close to them, what's in their supermarket cart affects their uh, inflation expectations.